Actually, let's do a few questions before we do more of this. Let's do a few questions from the back just to jog your memory. So we'll look at... Uh, Uh, let's do number 27 here. Well, it doesn't have a page number, but it's page 4. It's in the back of your book. Test w 1. Test what? Oh, test what? I don't know. Somebody tell me. Exam 3, maybe 2. Sure. 3, exam 3. All right, so we're doing number 27 here. And then if you finish that one, go on to exam number 28, or problem number 28, rather. You don't have your workbook. It's in your workbook. It's exam three. All right, feel free to ask your neighbor what they put. And we will stop at 125, 125. Just about five more seconds. Just guess if you're not sure. All right. Let's see. I think C is right. Let's take a look. So what you want to know is, Realize that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So here, cubes one and two attract each other. So for example, one of them could be negative and one of them could be positive. Turns out that it doesn't matter which one you choose to be negative or positive. And then, so if I take one to be negative, that means three is also negative. All right, so if I put cube two and three together, that's this one and this one, then they are going to attract to one another. Look, you could have done the other. You could have said, well, this one's positive and this one's negative, and then this one would be positive, uh, and this one would be positive. So then I would be dealing with uh, a positive and a negative value, and they would also attract. So you just sort of envision what scenario plays out there, and it doesn't really matter if you choose object number one to be positive or negative. What really matters is the relative charges to one another. Let's look at number 28 as well. Number 28, I have two charges, I bring them closer together, how does that affect the new force? First of all, ask yourself, is the force going to be bigger or smaller? And then ask yourself, by how much is it going to be bigger or smaller? Or is it the same? All right, uh, let's do about 15 more seconds. Stop at one minute. And guys, these old exams are good practice for you to prepare for your exam. There's a bunch more on the website, so check it out. Uh, just a few more seconds. All right, good job. E is right. Uh, I know bringing them closer together, I'm going to have a bigger force. Because if R decreases, F gets bigger. I know that from looking at Coulomb's law. If this goes down, this goes up. And it's going down by a factor of one half. But one half squared is equal to one quarter. Or excuse me, is equal to four. Because it's one over one half squared. So if I square one half, it's a quarter. And one over a quarter is equal to four. 
Okay. Is that clear, y'all? Yeah. Okay. We'll certainly see some of those on the test next week where I ask you if something changes in the scenario, how does it affect something else? Um, let's do number 25 here. Which of these has units of newtons per coulomb? Think of my forces, fields, potentials, potential energy, uh, and potential difference. Which of those have units of newtons per coulomb? And remember, newtons is a unit of what? Force, right? Like, you know, your quarter newton, or your newton burger at McDonald's. Did I tell you about that? The newton burger? Because a newton is like a quarter pound, and they could call it, instead of a quarter pounder, they could call it a newton burger. Okay, so anyway, that's a force, and this is charge. So what I'm asking is, which of these has units of force per charge? Which has force per unit charge? All right. Many of you have the right answer. A few of you don't, so feel free to ask your neighbor what they put. We'll stop at 115, 115. Okay, E is right. Make sure that you know these different distinctions uh, for electric potential. That is energy per charge. Electric fields is force per charge. We have these lines of force, or a force field, you can think of it. So this is a force per charge, or you can think of it as a force field. We have electric forces, that's just a force. This is just energy. And then electric potential and potential difference, these are largely the same. They're a little bit different, but they're both energy per unit charge. The difference, of course, is that potential difference is the difference between two points in space in the potential, whereas the electric potential is just the energy per charge at a particular point. It'd be like saying the potential energy at this point is 10 joules. The potential energy difference between this point and this point is 7 joules. Right? It's the difference between two points, whereas this one is just the energy per charge at a particular point. So that's what that difference means. Um, let's try number 22. Sodium atom has 11 protons. How many electrons does the sodium cation have, the cation? Is that 10, 11, or 12? Or maybe it depends on the number of neutrons that sodium has. What is a cation? You need to know cation. All right, let's uh, stop at 35, 35, it's a couple more seconds. Okay, good. A is right, uh, because a cation, you first need to know that a cation is a positive ion. So that means that this thing is going to have fewer protons than, or fewer electrons than protons. So the number of protons should be bigger than the number of electrons in order for it to be a cation. Uh, the number of protons is 11, so the number of electrons has to be 10. If it's an anion, it's going to be 12 or more, right? But of these options, an anion would have 12. And if it wasn't an ion, it was a neutral atom then it would have 11 electrons, the same number of protons and electrons. All right, so know your basic model of the atom. It's made up of, you know, electrons, protons, and uh, neutrons. We'll get more into that in the next chapter. Uh, looks like a lot of this other stuff is body stuff. Oh, yeah, let's try this one. I have this... Uh, plate number 40, and then we'll move on with uh, capacitors, but this is actually relevant here. I have this plate, and there's a positive particle in between it. On one side, I have high potential. On the other side, I have low potential. 
And I want to know what will happen to the particle. Will it move to the right, the left, or will it remain stationary? What happens to particles when they experience this difference in potential? Move to the right, the left, or will it remain stationary? All right, let's stop at 50, 50, 10 more seconds. Okay, doing pretty well, 50. Okay, A is right. Uh, you can think of this, remember we drew the mountain, and we said that positive particles will move from high to low potential. They move from high potential energy to low potential energy. And in general, particles do that. Although, remember, negative particles do the opposite because they're kind of wonky that way. You can also think of this in terms of capacitors. Like a capacitor, remember we talked about how that's two metal plates? On a capacitor, the high potential side has positive charges. The low potential side has negative charges. In fact, if you remember, V was KQ over R. Because on this side, the charge is negative, this side has a negative potential. And this side has a positive potential. Because Q is negative, V, the energy per unit charge on this side, is negative. So when I say low, it's actually a negative potential. In fact, if this is plus 10, this is minus 10. But it's still high and low potential. And so when I think about these positive and negative charges, the positive charge here is going to repel from the positive charge here, and it's going to be attracted to the positive charge here. I can also draw, as we've done, I can draw the electric field lines. And the electric field lines, which remember we said that was capital E, point from the high to low potential. And positive charges will travel along electric field lines. So this is going to be our model for the atom, or the, the cell, rather, when we go into the cell, that will have positive, or will have cations on one side, anions on one side, and that sets up a potential difference between those two sides of the cell membrane, causing particles to move from one side to the other. We're going to get into that today. All right. Good. As I said, those tests are a good way for you to practice. Some of you said that in the comments. Um, so like, if you need more practice, especially on those equation problems, you'll find more of those in the test. So I know that dealing with the equations, you know, so some of you math just isn't your strong suit, and that's that's okay. Although you know we need as citizens, like we need to have some level of understanding of mathematics just to live. But I understand that you know. I understand, but practice is really your answer. That that you need to practice more on those equation problems, and we'll practice them some in class. But going through the old exams is also uh, a great way to practice. All right, so let's see. We we're looking at capacitance. We had said before that a capacitor deals uh, consists of two metal plates. You have one metal plate here, one metal plate here. They don't touch. So there are actually no charges that transfer between the plates. They're parallel plates. They never touch. So there's no current, there's no charge flowing between the plates. Uh, but we do set up this distribution of charge when you connect them to a battery. When you connect them to a battery, you get uh, positive charge over here because all the electrons are drawn away and then negative charge over here because the electrons are deposited onto this side. Uh, the capacitance of the device describes the capacity to store charge. So we have two things that are related. Did we do this already? Let me see. One, right. Yeah, so we have two things that describe our capacitor. I'm going to sort of redraw them here. Uh, that's not a very good drawing, but you get the idea. I have these capacitors. I have the distance between the plates, and then I also have the area of the plates. I'll call that capital A. So those are two uh, geometric features of the capacitor, describing its, uh, you know, its dimensions. How far away are the plates? Are they really close together? Or are they farther apart? 
Now, how would you think, and then also how big are the plates? Are they itty bitty or are they real big? How would you think the area would affect the amount of charge that you can store? If I make these plates bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, how is that going to affect the amount of charge that I can store in those plates? Does it mean that it increases the amount of charge that I can store or decreases the amount of charge? If I make my plates bigger, how does that affect the amount of charge that can I can hold? It goes up or down? It increases. That's as you would think. It's like, you know, having a bucket. You can think of this as a bucket that you're putting charges in. If you make it bigger, you can store more charges. And so if the area increases, C increases. Your capacity to store charge increases. What if the distance increases? And this is less obvious. I mean, not that the previous was obvious, but I think this is less obvious. If I take my plates and I move them farther apart, how is that going to affect the amount of char charge that I can store? Increase or decrease? If I move them farther apart, does it increase or decrease the amount of charge? I just heard crease, right? Decrease? What do you think? Decrease. Yeah, it's going to decrease the amount of charge. If I pull those plates apart, it's sort of like you can think of the energy is spread out over a larger area, right? Because you know, it requires some energy to put those charges into place, and it decreases the capacitance. So C decreases. So we get this expression for the capacitance is equal to the area over the distance, and then we have a um, a constant which is called the permeability of free space. I'm just going to call it a constant. You don't need to know the value of it because you're not going to calculate it, but it's just sort of like a proportionality constant. We've seen them before, but it's just a constant. Um, and E is equal to the Greek letter kappa, or if you just want to call it K, that's fine, uh, times E naught. And here, kappa is the dielectric constant. You might have heard of dielectrics before, or maybe not. Uh, but a dielectric is just a material that you put in between it. So a dielectric is here. You would put that material in between the two charges. Uh, the dielectric constant is determined experimentally. That is, they have a capacitor and they measure the capacitance without the dielectric and then with the dielectric and they just see how much has the capacitance increased. And so the dielectric constant, if we look at our capacitance, let's say that uh, without the dielectric, our capacitance is C. With the dielectric, our capacitance is kappa times C. Right, so if our dielectric constant is 2, then that means we've increased our capacitance to store charge, our capacity to store charge by a factor of 2. Okay? So several things involved with capacitors. The area, the distance between the plates, and then the, the dielectric, that insulator that you put in between the plates. If you've ever taken apart a capacitor, you'll see that it's just two little metal plates. They're all rolled up, and there's a piece of wax paper in between them. That's the dielectric. I'll show you that in just a moment uh, when we, we'll have a little video where they take it apart. The dielectric constant is always greater than 1. It's never less than 1. It only increases the capacitance. It doesn't decrease it. Uh, the purpose of a capacitor is to store charge. Uh, wait, hold on. I think that's right. I mean, that is right, but I think that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, to store charge. As a result, it, it stores energy that can be used for later. So a capacitor is really to store energy. Uh, capacitors are also used for timing circuits. So anytime you have like a, a flashing light, for example, what it's doing is it's storing up the charge on the capacitor, and then it's discharging. Storing charge, discharging. Storing charge, discharging. And that happens at a very regular rate, which is the rate governed by the circuit and the capacitors that are involved, and also the rate that you want for your flashers to go off and on, or whatever flashing light you have, or whatever regularly occurring periodic thing that you have probably uses a capacitor of some sort. Uh, when you connect it to a battery, the charge is equal to uh, 
C times V. These are all linear equations, so you need all these equations. But if I have a capacitor hooked up to a battery like this, the amount of charge, the capacitance of it is that the amount of charge that's on that capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the voltage. And the amount of energy that's stored is one half CV squared. So for example, if I said you have this capacitor that's hooked up to a 12 volt battery, what happens if you increase the voltage to 24 volts? Let me, let's do this as a quicker question. So you increase V from 12 to 24 volts. How does this change the charge? that stored on the capacitor. Uh, so I've increased my voltage by a factor of 2. Does my charge, is it going to be half, a quarter? Is it going to be the same as it was initially? Or is it going to be twice? Or is it going to be four times the original amount? So I, I changed my voltage. It was 12 volts. I increased it to 24 volts. How does this change the charge that's being stored by the capacitor? Do I now store half the charge? Oh, I'm sorry, this should be a quarter. A quarter of the charge, the same charge, or four times the charge? So it's a four right here. All right, let's stop at 55, 55. Feel free to share your answer with your neighbors. Fifty-five. Okay, D is right. It's going to increase it by a factor of two. Look, let's look at this. I have Q is equal to C times V. If I increase the voltage, I increase the charge. It's a linear relationship, right? Because there's no square there. It's not. It's also a direct relationship. It's not in the denominator. And so if I double this voltage, that means I'm going to double my charge. It'll double the amount of charge that's held by that capacitor. All right? Um, the sodium-potassium pump, which we'll talk about later, the sodium potassium pump, it does not use a capacitor. But in a lot of ways, it's like a capacitor uh, because there is a there's a potential difference between the two sides. Uh, the two sides of the cell membrane. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we'll get to it soon, but you, you've already read the chapter, so you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's also a... Um, there's also a, a capacitor of sorts. It's not really a capacitor, but it's sort of like a capacitor. Set up between the two sides, because in your cell, you know, you got the membrane here, and you got positive charges on one side and negative charges on the other. Although we'll see that it's really a little more complicated. It's really that sort of one side is a little more positive than the other, and the other side is a little more negative than the other. But so there is a capacitor sort of set up between these two sides. And if you know then the uh, the capacitance of the cell, which you can calculate or even measure, then you can calculate the charge involved. Uh, so some examples of capacitor use. You can use it for a flash on a camera. I mean, we used to use the cameras, and they would make that loud. It's like they were preparing to take off. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's older, <laughs> and then the flash would go off, and then it would take a few seconds to recharge. That's a capacitor, and it takes a certain amount of time to get enough charge on those capacitors and then they save it and use it until you're ready next. So a flash on a camera, uh, anytime you have a flashing light, 
you're storing up energy and saving it for later, this regularly occurring thing. Oh, your book talks about keys on a keyboard. I didn't know this, actually. I think it was your book that said that, wasn't it? Yeah. So the keys on a the keyboard, they're two metal plates. And when you push down on them, you're changing the distance between the two metal plates, which changes the capacitance. And then that sends a signal to the computer that, oh, you've just pressed the D key or whatever. Uh, because you're actually changing the capacitance. You're bringing those two plates closer together. And then when you release it, it brings them farther apart. That's pretty cool. I mean, you know, how else would you do that? It's, it's kind of a neat way of thinking about it. All right. Let's see. I have a video I want to show us. This is from MakeZine. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but he takes a part of capacitor. And I just want you to notice what the capacitor is made of when he takes it. The capacitor was pretty useful in understanding the role of electricity in the body. They would use, you might have seen pictures where they would use a frog and hook him up to a capacitor and make his leg switch. So I got through his bed. Y'all seen those pictures or heard of that? No, when they did that in some of the early experiments, and the way they used, the way they got the electricity was with the capacitor. They'd have these laden jars. They'd put charges on them. And then later when they needed the charges, they'd discharge it through the neural circuits of these little animals. Poor helpless little animals, too, were slaughtered. <laughs> okay. So let's look at current and resistance. You just need to have a working knowledge of sort of what this is. Current is the flow of charge. Uh, whenever we talk about flow, we're thinking of something per unit time. And so we're going to talk about it as the charge per time. So this is our charge per time. If we think of a wire, you can think of it as electrons are moving through the wire at a particular rate. It's a little more complicated than this, but not that much more complicated. Uh, and you ask yourself, how many charges per unit time are going past a particular point? What are the number of coulombs per second that are passing that point in a given amount of time? And then that tells you what your current is. You've probably heard of current. Um, you know, like the current of some electrical device in your home. Usually this refers to electrons moving through a wire. Though it can refer to any flow of charge. And so sometimes if you're reading about your body, you might hear about a certain current as these charges move through. You don't have to have a wire. All you have to have are moving charges in one direction. Uh, the unit is an ampere. I'll just call it an amp. Uh, one amp is equal to or equivalent to one coulomb per second. And a resistor is a device that limits or restricts or resists. The limits are, if it helps you, you can think of it as resist. The flow of electricity, that's why they call it a resistor, because it resists the flow of electricity. And you can sort of think about the the resistor as a pipe with water flowing through it. So a pipe has two dimensions. Right? It has a cross-sectional area, and then it also has a length. Right? So is it easier or more difficult to push through, say, a long pipe? That is, I'm asking, if L increases, if the length of your pipe increases, does the resistance A increase, B decrease, or does it C stay the same? If the length of your pipe, whatever you're trying to push the liquid through, or, or in this case electricity, if the length increases, does that resist the flow more? Does it resist the flow less? Or does the flow just go on as it was before? Yeah. The length. So if I have a pipe this long, I have a pipe this long. Okay? You follow what I'm saying? We talked about this similarly with uh, fluid flow before. Did I tell you all the story about the gasoline? Told you all that? Did I tell you all that story? 
The siphoning and gas. Yeah, okay, good. You can throw it again if you want. But. So if the length increases, what happens to the resistance? Let's stop at one minute, you know? Okay, so if the length increases, the resistance also increases. Um, so then L is proportional, or rather R is proportional to L. If L goes up, R goes up. And now let's ask the same question. Instead of L, what about the area? So for a pipe, you know, we have the length of it, but then we also have the cross-sectional area. Is it a small pipe or is it a big pipe? If I make the area bigger, what happens to the resistance? Does the resistance to the flow, does it increase, does it decrease, or does it stay the same? We have similar relationships like we saw with fluid flow about, goodness bless you, about the flow of, of a fluid through a pipe. But here, if the area goes up, what happens to the resistance? If your pipe gets bigger, what happens to your resistance? Okay, feel free to ask your neighbor. Many of you do have the right answer, but feel free to ask your neighbor. And we will stop at 40 seconds. 40 seconds, just a few more seconds. Okay, good. B is right. If my area goes up, the resistance goes down. And so we have this relationship for resistance. R is proportional to L. And R is proportional to 1 over A. And so our equation then is going to be R is equal to L over A. And then, of course, we have a constant, right? This is called the resistivity. Uh, here, rho, that's our Greek letter rho, is the resistivity. It's different for different materials. What does wood have? Does it have a high resistivity or low resistivity, you think? Now, notice the relationship here that if r rho goes up, the resistance goes up. So would wood have a high resistivity or a low resistivity? What does wood have a high or low resistance to the flow of electricity? Does wood conduct electricity? No. So it would have a very big resistance. It's not going to conduct electricity. It resists the flow of electricity a lot. So wood, then, which has a high resistance, is also going to have a high resistivity. So wood has a high resistivity. And uh, I don't know, copper, for example, is going to have a low resistivity because it has a very low resistance. That's just a constant. We measure it um, you know, experimentally. That is, you measure a the dimensions of an object, and then you measure the resistance of it, and you can calculate that resistivity. Okay, so the current is dependent on both the resistance and the potential. This is our potential of our battery, and resistance is just the resistance of our resistor. And so this is a simple circuit. This symbol right here represents a battery. It has a certain potential. This is our resistor. I like see. Uh, and then we have current that's flowing through this at a particular rate. If I make the resistor bigger, if it resists the flow of electricity, what do you think is going to happen to the current? If I'm resisting the flow of electricity more, the current will go up or go down? It's going to go down. Like if I'm resisting the flow of electricity, I'm saying, whoa, slow down, electrons. And then they'll slow down and they won't go as fast. So if if R goes up, then I will go down because you're resisting the flow of electricity. Similarly, if V goes up, well, what is V a measure of? What is the basic principle behind potential? We said it's something per something. What is the potential? It's what per what? It's energy per, per charge, right? Remember, we had forces, fields, and potential. Forces are newtons. Fields are force per unit charge, and potential is energy per unit charge. So you can think of a, a battery 
uh, if you're returning to that water analogy, is like a paddle wheel. And if you put a lot of energy into the the uh, the fluid, or a lot of energy you give to your electrons, what's going to happen to the rate at which they flow? Is it going to go up or down? It's going to go up. Right. So uh, if V goes up, then I is going to go up. And so we have this expression for V, for I rather. I is equal to V over R. Uh, notice if V goes up, I goes up. If R goes up, I goes down. And so it meets those requirements for how the current is dependent upon the potential, which is energy per charge, and the current, or the resistance, which is the rate at which something, or rather, the resistance of a device to resist the flow of electricity. Usually, this is called Ohm's Law, and usually we see it like this. V is equal to IR. I don't remember how it is in the equation sheet. Uh, I have it in there, don't I? Yeah, it looks like I have it that second way. Usually, we write it like this, but these are the same, you know. Right? I just solved this for V. These two are the same. I cross-multiplied to get an expression for V. Okay. Um, Right, let's do a few clicker questions. Let's do this one up on the left. Right here first. And if you finish, go on and do the others. We'll do all of these. We'll do the one to the right next. All right, let's stop at 50 seconds. You just have five more seconds. We'll go to 52, so just a couple extra from there. 52. All right, uh, E is right. Remember, our capacitance is equal to, which I'm going to write a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as kappa epsilon naught A over D. That's how it's written in your equation sheet. Right, but this is similar. I just written uh, before I'd written this expression as epsilon instead of epsilon naught. It's not important for this question. But if the area of the plates is doubled because it's a direct relationship, it's the capacitance is also going to double. Let's go to the one on the right. This resistors what the flow of electricity? Stop, increase force or do they limit the flow of electricity? Stop, increase, force, or limit? All right, let's stop at uh, 28, 28. We'll go on to 30. 30 seconds, just three more seconds. Two, one. Hey, oh, it's a job. Awesome. All right. Listen, this isn't a joke. Like, this was a story that I read in the paper this morning. <laughs> there was this guy. Don't laugh, because it's terrible. This guy, he was in this terrible accident. And he lost, like, his left arm is a work accident. His left arm got cut off, and his left leg got cut off. <gasps> He's all right now. <laughs> You heard that one, Taylor. I told that one. <laughs> All right. I don't what did the fish say when it ran into the wall? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the units for electric potential are which of these? Right here. Is it means per coulomb, volts, potages, or joules? All right, let's stop at uh, 30. Five more seconds.
Okay, good. B is right. I understand newtons per coulomb, but remember newtons per coulomb, that's a force per unit charge. These are the units for electric fields. Remember those forces. Any, think force field, like in Star Wars or, or Star Trek or whatever, force field. That's sort of where that comes from, because a field is a force per unit charge or mass or whatever it is that you're talking about. Fields are always related to forces. So if you see forces, it's probably a field. Uh, let's do this one down here on the left. Let's stop at 25. The left, the one on the left, the one with the plates. We'll stop at 30. Okay, good. We had that one before, y'all remember? Uh, positive charges will move from high potential to low potential. Like you think about the electric field lines are going in this direction, so the positive charge will move along the lines of force. Or you can think of positive charges over here and negative charges over here, which will give you high and low potential, which will repel and attract that positive charge. All right. Um, hey, do you know why cows make really great scientists? Did you know that, that cows make really great scientists? Did you know that? They're always outstanding in their fields. Uh, okay, here's this. Think about your resistance. All right, I'm going to write the equation for you, but you know, if you get one of these on the test, you just look at your equation sheet and find which of these is the equation for resistance. So you'll need to be familiar with it. So I have one wire that has a resistance of 12 ohms. But I increase the area of the wire to 4 meters squared from 2 meters squared. What is the resistance of this bigger wire? And it has a length of 4 meters. All right, let's go to 115. So it's 10 seconds from now. 10 seconds. It's five more seconds. Call me in. Okay. So B is right. Um, my resistance, my length goes up. So that means my resistance is going to increase. It's like, you know, that big pipe you're trying to push water through. So the resistance was 12 ohms, so I know I can get rid of all three of these. And now I ask, by how much is it going to go up? Well, it's going to go up by a factor of 2, because the length, or excuse me, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's not the length we're increasing, right? It's the area. I made a mistake. So the area is going up. That means the resistance is going to go down. Okay. So that means I can get rid of these three because I know my resistance has to be less than 12 ohms. And now I ask myself, how much is it going up? Well, it's going from 2 meters squared to 4 meters squared. So it's going up by a factor of 2 because 2 times 2 is 4. And so if it's going up by a factor of 2, that means the resistance is decreasing by a factor of a half. It was 12 ohms, so now it's 6 ohms. Because 12 divided by 2 is 6. Oh, sorry. Oh, that is what y'all put, right? Is it B? Yeah. All right. One more thing about electricity, and I'll show you the Van de Graaff. I should have time for it. Uh, electricity going through a resistor will expend energy. You have a look down the barrel of your hair dryer. Ladies, gentlemen too, maybe. Every morning I use my hair dryer. And then I look down the barrel. Because I look down in there and there's a wire that runs inside your uh, hair dryer. Is it orangey? 
magnet is really hot, right? It's it's a resistor. It's, it has a very low resistance, so it allows a lot of electricity to flow through it. But you're right, it turns really orange. It's because it's so hot, right? It's like a heating element. Yeah. It's like a toaster. A toaster is just like a like a big resistor down in there. Uh, and so whenever you run current through it, it expends energy. It gives out energy in the form of thermal energy. And actually, those things give out a lot of energy. They're like one of the biggest users of energy in your home. Yeah. And then, of course, your clothes dryer, which is just like a huge hair dryer, and your heating unit, if you have an electrical heating unit, works by the same thing. Uh, but that energy, remember voltage is energy per charge. That's U over Q. So that U, that energy, is equal to Q times V. And since the power is energy per time, we've defined power before, but it's a measure of energy per time. We defined that back in Chapter 3. Then our power is equal to U divided by T, which is Q times V divided by T. But now look at this. We have Q over T, charge over time. That's equal to our current. So our power is equal to V times I. T is equal to VI. And so electricians and electrical engineers and just regular people will use this to determine the amount of current that an object is drawing if it has a certain power rating. It's, electricians use this a lot because they want to know how much current is that hair dryer pulling. Well, if it has a power of, you know, 1,000 watts maybe for your hair dryer, and it's operating at, say, 120 volts, which it is in your house, then you can calculate the current. It's going to be something like 10 amps. Right. Um, or, for example, this light bulb, it has a voltage of 120 volts. Everything in your home operates at that voltage, and it has a current of 2 amps. So that power, then, would be V times I, or 120 volts times 2 amps, which would be 240 watts. That's a pretty bright light bulb, like one of those big spotlights. Okay? So uh, be able to, given the power of an object, be able to determine its current. It would be some simple math, but, you know, like for example, if I said the power is a thousand watts, the voltage is a hundred volts, what is the current? Well, the current would be P over V, which is a thousand divided by 100, which would be equal to 10 amps. It would be something along those lines, like the number-wise, so it would be nice even numbers for you to work with. Okay? But power is related to both the voltage, the energy per charge, and then the flow of charge, the current. Can I go down from here? All right. Electricians actually use that power equation and Ohm's law quite a bit. Um, let's see, it's 10 o'clock. Static electricity refers to the buildup of excess charge on an object. Uh, most of the charge on the human body, if we have, and we have charges inside our body, but most of the excess charge that we have is in the, the uh, skin or hair. We can get charges to move around on our body. And today I brought this device. This is called a, a Van de Graaff generator. And there's a picture of one in your, in your workbook. Some of you might have seen them before. Oh. Uh, Let's try this. I'm going to see if you'll be able to see it. Huh. Anyway, what this is, listen, when I was a kid, or when I was in high school, went to like the math and science school, not in Louisiana, but in Mississippi, so it was better, you know. But, <laughs> uh, was it? oh, I had a roommate, Chris Reese, and he, uh, he was kind of a straight-laced guy. And he would go to bed really early. But all the rest of us, we were like troublemakers. So we'd stay up really late to study and stuff like that. And so I remember one night I was up to like 1 o'clock. And Chris was over asleep. He'd gone to sleep at like 11. And he was... And I was looking at him. And I got bored. And so I got up. And I shuffled my feet on the floor. And then I walked over to Chris. And I 
didn't touch him, and just sort of brought my finger up close to his ear. And it was a particularly dry day, so what do you think happened to him? It shocked him. Like, I could see the charge jump from my finger to his ear. It was a remarkably good night for charges. Uh, did he wake up? No, because he was dead asleep. Did I do it again? <laughs> he wasn't dead. <laughs> he was still asleep. He's still alive. All right. So um, anyway, what happens there is you rub your feet on the carpet, and you get electrons that transfer from the carpet onto your feet. And then they can travel on the skin of your body. And so they travel out usually to the, the parts of your body that are the most extreme and that are sort of the pointiest, like your fingers. Uh, and that's why when you touch somebody, you know, it's you can touch them with your finger. And that's, by the way, when you get out of your car, you slide off of those velour seats or those shag seats that you have in your car. And then you go to touch your car handle and it shocks you. Especially on dry days that happens. Uh, but a better way to do that is to sort of rub your elbow against the car, and that gets rid of the charge. It, it sort of removes it from your elbow, which doesn't hurt as much. as I do too, Daisy. Y'all should do the same and tell all your friends. Me too. Look at this. We all do this. The cool people, anyway. Just the three of us. <laughs> Okay, so what this is, is this is a, a rubber belt, and down inside here, there's a little piece of carpet, and the rubber belt rubs up against the piece of carpet, just like your feet. And then it's sort of like a, an elevator where it connects here, and it comes up here, picks up charges on the carpet, and then it brings them up here and deposits them onto this big metal sphere right here. And so we can get a lot of charge. It's actually a pretty good day for it today because it's dry. We can get a lot of charge. I'm not sure how this is going to look with the light. I might have to dim it. Or it might be really cool. I've never done it. Oh, yeah, you can actually see. You see on the screen, you can sort of see how it's distorting the air around it. It's sort of just catching the air on fire right around there. And you can see the spark there. That's what it looked like with Chris's ear. Now, listen. To put an electron across an inch of space is about 20,000 volts, 20,000 joules per coulomb. So this was about three to four inches. So you're talking about 80, 70 to 100,000 volts of potential difference. Now it's different from the voltage that we have here. It's because this is alternating current and the current's different, but it can still hurt. Like if you touch it and it can, it won't kill you, but it will, it will hurt. So we can do lots of things with this. Um, you can touch it, or you can put your hands on it, and it actually causes to get lots of charge in your hair, lots of electrons in your hair, and all over your body. And so y'all can try it if you want. We can take a couple people. I think we have enough time. Who wants to do it? You want to do it? All right. All right, you have to. Where's my stool? Oh, I got to get you a stool. I'll be right back. If you don't have a stool, the charges will just go straight through your body and into the ground. I could, my stool is upstairs. Look, I brought these, these uh, P-Rows. So I'm going to put some paper over them and protect them. They are important. The yearbook. Huh? Okay. I'm not, I'm not making some statement by using them for her to stand on. So come on over here. Yeah. I 
Okay, well, listen, just put your hands on there, and don't do anything unless I tell you, okay? You can put your hands on now. Yeah, let me shift this around. Yeah, I mean, like, go ahead and put your hands on. Both hands, yeah. All right? All right. <laughs> like, there's very little chance that you'll actually die. Let me go ahead and turn it on. Don't take your hands off. You can take one hand off if you want, but don't take both hands off. Now, Taylor has darker hair, and darker hair, I don't know if y'all knew this, is, is heavier than lighter hair. Did y'all know that? Oh, yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah, so can, you can feel it, right? Oh, it feels heavier. Yeah, so right now, you can sort of see the top of her head. It's the hairs are, the little hairs are starting to stand up. Can you feel it, Taylor? No? Can y'all see it on her? You must be able to feel the tingling by now. Do you feel any tingling at all? Yeah. You got thick hair, right? So it's heavier. That's what that means. It's thick hair. Like, really, like, Taylor or Alexa. Yeah. You can take a hand and sort of do like this if you want. Just one hand. Well, if she takes off both hands, this thing will get charged up more than she is. And you'll get a discharge between her. Oh, hold your hand up. Between her and the uh, sphere. All right, put it back on. I'm going to turn it off. All right, you can step off. Yeah, you can take your hands off now. You can sort of shake around. Don't touch anybody. <laughs> For another minute. All right, you can go out of seat. Let me do it, and then we can let somebody else do it. Sorry, Taylor, you don't have the best hair for this. But look at me. I made this hair for this business alone.